Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels 1892 English Edition Introduction The present little book is, originally, part of a larger whole. About 1875, Dr. E. Döring, Preva Dalsont, a university lecturer who formerly received fees from his students rather than a wage, at Berlin University, suddenly and rather clamorously announced his conversion to socialism and presented the German public not only with an elaborate socialist theory, but also with a complete practical plan for the reorganization of society. As a matter of course, he fell foul of his predecessors. Above all, he honored Marx by pouring out upon him the full vials of his wrath. This took place about the same time when the two sections of the Socialist Party in Germany, Eisenachers and Lassalians, had just effected their fusion at the Gotha Unification Congress, and thus attained not only an immense increase of strength, but what was more, the faculty of employing the whole of this strength against the common enemy. The Socialist Party in Germany was fast becoming a power, but to make it a power, the first condition was that the newly conquered unity should not be imperiled and Dr. During openly proceeded to form around himself a sect, the nucleus of a future separate party. It thus became necessary to take up the gauntlet thrown down to us, and to fight out the struggle, whether we liked it or not. This, however, though it may not be an over-difficult, was evidently a long-winded business. As is well known, we Germans are of a terribly ponderous Grundlichkeit, or radical profoundity, or profound radicality, whatever you may like to call it. Whenever any of us expounds what he considers a new doctrine, he has first to elaborate it in all, into an all-compromising system. He has to prove that both the first principles of logic and the fundamental laws of the universe had existed from all eternity for no other purpose than to ultimately lead to this newly discovered crowning theory. And Dr. During, in this respect, was quite up to the national mark. Nothing less than a complete system of philosophy. Mental, more natural, and historical. A complete system of political economy and socialism. And finally, a, crit a critical history of political economy. Three big volumes in October, heavily intri extrinsic, intrinsically and intrinsically. Three army corps of arguments mobilized against all previous philosophers and economists in general, and against Marx in particular. In fact, an attempt at a complete revolution in science. These were what I should have to tackle. 
I had to treat all of all and every possible subject, from concepts of time and space to bimetallism, from the etern eternity of matter and motion to the per perishable nature of moral ideas, from Darwin's natural selection to the education of youth and the future society. Anyhow, the systematic comprehensiveness of my opponent gave me the opportunity of developing, in opposition to him, and in more in a more connected form that than had previously been done, the views held by Marx and myself on this great variety of subjects, and that was the principal reason which made me undertake this otherwise ungrateful task. My reply was first published in a series of articles in the Leps Leipzig Vorwart Vorwarts, the chief organ of the Socialist Party and later on as a book. Here again, Durings Umvrasung der Wissenschaft. From Mr. E. Durings Revolution in Science, and the second edition of which appeared in Zurich, 1886, Anno At the request of my friend, Paul Lafargue, now representative of L'Ell in the French Chamber of Deputies, I arranged three chapters of this book as a pamphlet, which he translated and published in 1880 under the title Socialisme Utopique et Socialisme Scientifique. From this French text, from this French text, a Polish and a Spanish edition were prepared. In 1883, our German friends brought out the pamphlet in the original language, Italian. Russian, Danish, Dutch, and Romanian translations based upon the German text have since been published. Thus the present English edition, this little book circulates in ten languages, I am not aware that any other socialist work not even our Communist Manifesto of 1848 or Marxist Capital has been so often translated. In Germany, has had four editions of about 20,000 copies in all. The Appendix, The Mark was written with the intention of spreading among the German Socialist Party some elementary knowledge of the history and development of landed property in Germany. This seemed all the more necessary at a time when the assimilation by that party of the working people of the towns was in a fair way of completion, and when the agricultural laborers and peasants had to be taken in hand. This appendix has been included in the translation and the original forms of tenure of land common to all Teutonic tribes, and the history of their decay are even less known in England and in Germany. I have left the text as it stands in the original, without alluding to the hypotheses recently stated by Maxim Kowalewski, according to which the partition of the arable and meadow lands among the members of the mark was preceded by their being cultivated for joint account by a large patriarchal family community, embracing several generations, as exemplified by the still existing South Slavonian Zadruga, and that the partition later on took place when the community had increased so as to become too unwieldy for joint account management. Kowalewski is probably quite right, but the matter is still sub judice, or under consideration. The economic terms in this work, as far as they are new, agree with those used in the English edition of Marx's Capital. We call production of commodities that economic phase where articles are produced not only for the use of the producers, but also for the purpose of exchange. It is as commodities 
not as use values. This phase extends from the first beginnings of production for exchange down to our present time, and attains its full development under capitalist production only. It is under conditions where the capitalist, the owner of the means of production, employees for wages, laborers, people deprived of all means of production except their own labor power, and pockets the excess of the selling price of the products over his outlay. We divide the history of industrial production since the Middle Ages into three periods. Handicraft, small master craftsmen with a few journeymen and apprentices where each laborer produces a complete article. Manufacture, where great numbers of workmen grouped in one large establishment produce the complete article on the principle of division of labor, each workman performing only one partial operation so that the product is complete only after having passed successfully through the hands of all. Modern in industry, where the product is produced by machinery driven by power and where the work of the laborer is limited to superintending and correcting the performance of the mechanical agent. I am perfectly aware that the contents of this work will meet with objection from a considerable portion of the British public, but if we continentals had taken the slightest notice of the prejudices of British respectability, we should be even worse off than we are. This book defends what we call historical materialism, and the word materialism grates upon the ears of the immense majority of British readers. Agnosticism might be tolerated, but materialism is utterly inadmissible. And yet the original home of old modern materialism from the 17th century onwards is England. Materialism is the natural born son of Great Britain. Already the British Goleman Don Scottus asked whether it was impossible for the matter to think. In order to effect this miracle, he took refuge in God's omnipotence. It is, he made theology preach materialism. Moreover, he was a nominalist. Nominalism, the first form of materialism, is chiefly found among the English schoolmen. The real progenitor of English materialism is Bacon. To him, natural philosophy is the only true philosophy. And physics, based upon the experience of the senses, is the chiefest part of natural philosophy. Anazagoras and his Homion Maria, Democritus and his Atoms, he often quotes as his authorities. According to him, the senses are infallible and the source of all knowledge. All science is based upon experience, and consists in subjecting the data furnished by the senses to a rational method of investigation, induction, analysis, comparison, observation, experiment, and the principal forms of such a rational method. Among the qualities inherent in matter, motion is the first and foremost, not only in the form of mechanical and mathematical motion, but chiefly in the form of an impulse, a vital spirit, attention, or a qual, to use a term of Jacob Bohm's of Mator. In Bacon's, in Bacon, its first creator, materialism still accrues within itself the germs of a many sided development. On the one hand, matter surrounded by a sensuous poetic glamour seems to attract men's whole entity by winning smiles. On the other hand, the aphoristically formulated doctrine pollutes 
of inconsistencies imparted from theology. In further evolution, materialism became, becomes one-sided. Hobbes is the man who systematizes Baconian materialism. Knowledge based upon the senses loses its poetic blossom. It passes into the abstract experience of the mathematician. Geometry is proclaimed as the queen of sciences. Materialism takes to misanthropy. It is to overcome its opponent, misanthropic, flashless spiritualism. And that on the latter's own ground, materialism has to chastise its own flesh and turn ascetic. Thus for from a sensual, it passes into an intellectual entity, but thus too it involves only consistency, regardless of consequences, characteristic of the intellect. Hobbes, as Bacon's continuator, argues th thus, If all human knowledge is furnished by the senses, then our concepts and ideas are but the phantoms, divested of their own sensuous, sensual forms of the real world. Philosophy can give but names to these phantoms, one name may be applied to more than one of them. There may even be names of names. It would imply a contradiction if, on the one hand, we maintain that all ideas had their origin in the world of sensation, and on the other hand, that a world was more than a word. That, besides the beings known to us by our senses, beings which are one and all individuals, there existed also beings of a general and individual nature. An unbodily substance is the same absurdity as an unbodily body. Body being substance are but different terms for the same reality. It is impossible to separate thought from matter that thinks. This matter is a sub substratum of all f changes going on in the world. The world infinite, the word infinite is meaningless unless it states that our mind is capable of performing an endless process of addition. Only material things being perceptible to us, we cannot know anything but about the existence of God. My own existence alone is certain. Every human passion is mechanical movement, which has a beginning and an end. The objects of impulse are what we call good. Man is subject to the same laws as nature. Power and freedom are identical. Hobbes has systematized Bacon, without, however, furnishing a proof for Bacon's fundamentals principle. The origin of all human knowledge from the world of sensation. It was like who, in the in his essay on human understanding, supplied this proof. Hobbes had shattered the theistic prejudices of Baconian materialism. Collins, Dodwell, Carwell, Hartwell, Hartley, Priestele similarly shattered the last theological bars that still hemmed in Locke's sensationalism. At all events, for practical materialist, theism is but an easy-going way of getting rid of religion. Karl Marx, The Holy Family, pages 201 to 204. <laughs> Thus, Karl Marx wrote about the British origin of modern materialism. If English men nowadays do not exactly relish the compliment he paid their ex ancestors, more is a pity. It is nonetheless undeniable that Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke are the fathers of that brilliant school a French materialism which made the 18th century. In spite of all the battles on land and sea won over, Fren won over Frenchmen by Germans and Englishmen, a preeminently French century, even before that crowning French Revolution, the results of which we outsiders in England as well as Germany are still trying to acclimatize, there is no denying it. About the middle of the century, what struck every cultivated, 
cultivated foreigner who set up his residence in England was what he was then bound to consider the religious bigotry and the stupidity and the stupidity of the English respectable middle class. We at the time at that time were all materialists or at least very advanced free thinkers and to us it appeared inconceivable that almost all educated people in England should believe in all sorts of impossible miracles, and that even geo geologists like Buckland and Mattel should contort the facts of their science so as not to, not to clash too much with the myths of the Book of Genesis, in order to find people who dare to use their own intellectual faculties with regard to religious matters. You had to go amongst the ed educated, the great unwashed, as they were called, the working people, especially the Owenite socialists. But England had been civilized since then. The expedition of 1851 sounded the knell of English insular exclusiveness. England became gradually internationalized and died in matters and ideas, so much so that I began to wish that some English manners and customs had made as much headway on the continent as other continental habits have made here. Anyhow, the introduction and spread of salad oil before 1850, 1851, not only to the aristocracy, has been accompanied by a fatal spread of continental skepticism in matters religious. It has come to this that agnosticism, though not yet considered the thing, quite as much as the Church of England, is yet very nearly on a par, as far as respectability goes, with baptism, and decidedly ranks above the salvation anime. And I cannot help believing that under those circumstances it will be consoling to many who sincerely regret and condemn this progress of infant to learn that these new fangled notions are not of foreign origin, are not made in Germany like so many other articles of daily use, but are undoubtedly Old English, and their British originators two hundred years ago, with a good deal further than their descendants now dare to venture. What indeed is an agnosticism but to use an expressive Lincolnshire term, shame faced materialism? The agnostic's conception of nature is materialistic throughout. The entire natural world is governed by law and absolutely excludes the intervention of action from without. But he adds, we have no means either of ascertaining or of disproving uh, the existence of some supreme being beyond the known universe. That is my hope, good. At the time when Laplace, to Napoleon's question, why in the great astronomers, treaties, and celestial mechanics, the creator was not even mentioned. Proudly replied, I had no need of this <coughs> hypothesis. For nowadays, in our evolutionary conception of the universe, there is absolutely no room for either a creator or a ruler. In the talk of a supreme being shut out from the whole existing world implies a contradiction in terms, as it seems to me a gen a gratuitous insult to the feelings of religious people. Again, our Gnostic admits that all our knowledge is based upon the information impacted to us by our senses. But he adds, how do we know that our senses gives us correct representations of the objects we 
we perceive through them. And he proceeds to inform us that, whenever we speak of objects or their qualities, of which he cannot know any firm for certain, but merely impressions which they have produced on his senses. Now this line of reasoning seems undoubtedly hard to beat by mere argumentation, but before there was argumentation, there was action. And Im Arfang war die that from Guthers Fast. In the beginning was the deed. And human action had solved the difficulty long before human ingenuity invented it. The proof of the pudding is the is in the eating. From the moment we turn to our own use these objects according to the qualities we perceive in them, we put to an infallible test the correctness of other ways of our sense perception. And these perceptions have been wrong, then our estimate of the use to which an object can be turned must also be wrong, and our attempt must fail. But if we succeed in accomplishing our aim, if we find that the object does agree with our idea of it, and does answer the purpose we intended it for, then that is proof positive that our perceptions of it and its qualities so far agree with reality outside ourselves. And whenever we find ourselves face to face with its with a failure, then we generally are not long in making out the cause that made us fail. We find that the perception upon which we acted was either incomplete and superficial, or combined with the results of other perceptions in a way not warranted by them. what we call defective reasoning. So long as we take care to train our senses properly and to keep our action within the limits prescribed by perceptions properly made and properly used, so long as we shall find that the result of our action proves the conformity of our perceptions with the objective nature of the things perceived, not in one single instance so far have we led to the conclusion that our sense of perception, scientifically controlled, induce in our minds ideas respecting the outer world that are, by their very nature, at variance with reality, or that there is an inherent incompatibility between the outer world and our perceptions of it. But then come the Neo-Kantian agnostics and say, we may correctly perceive the qualities of a thing, but we cannot by any sensible or mental process grasp the thing in itself. This thing in itself, das thing, is beyond our ken. To this Hegel, long since, has replied, if you know all the qualities of a thing, you know the thing itself. Nothing remains but that the fact that the said thing exists without us. And when your senses have taught you that fact, you have grasped, grasped the last remnant of the thing in itself. Kant's celebrated unknowable thing an sich, or thing an sich. To which it may be added that in Kant's time our knowledge of natural objects was indeed so fragmentary that he might well suspect behind a little we knew about each of them a mysterious ding an sich. But one after another these ungraspable things have been grasped, analyzed, and what is more reproduced by the giant progress of science. And what we can produce we certainly cannot consider as unknowable, that the chemistry of the first half of this country this century, organic substances were such mysterious object. Now we learn to build them up, one after another, from their chemical elements, without the aid of organic processes. Modern chemists declare that as soon as the chemical constitution of no matter what body is known, it can be built up from, the, from its elements. 
we are still far from knowing the constitution of the highest organic substances, the albuminous bodies. But there is no reason why we should not, if only after centuries arrive at the knowledge and, armed with it, produce artificial albumum. But if we arrive at that, we shall at the same time have produced organic life for life from, the, from its lowest to its highest forms. It is but the moral, but it is the normal mode of existence of albuminous bodies. As soon, however, as our agnostic has made these formal mental reservations, he talks and acts, and as a rank materialist, materialist he a bomb is. He may say that, as far as we know, matter and motion, or as it is now called energy, can neither be created nor destroyed, but that we have no proof of their not having been created at some time or another. But if you can try to use this omission against him in any particular case, he will quickly put you out of court. If he admits the possibility of spiritualism and abstracto, he will have none of it in, in concreto. As far as we know, and can know, he will tell you there is no creator and no ruler of the universe. As far as we are concerned, matter and energy can neither be created nor annihilated. For us, mind is a mode of energy, a function of the brain. All we know is that the material world is governed by immutable laws, and so forth. Thus, as far as he is a scientific man, and as far as he knows anything, he is a materialist. Outside his science and spheres about which he knows nothing, he translates his ignorance into Greek and calls it agnosticism. At all events, one thing seems clear. Even if I was an agnostic, it is evident that I could not describe the conception of history sketched out in this little book as historical as an ag agnosticism. Religious people would laugh at me, and Gnostics would indignantly ask, was I making fun of them? And thus, I hope even British respectability will not be overshocked if I use, in English as well as many other languages, the term historical materialism to designate the, that view of the course of history which seeks the ultimate cause and the great moving power of all important historic events in the economic development of society, in the changes in the modes of production and exchange, and the consequent division of society into distinct classes, and as a struggle of these classes against one another. This indulgence will perhaps be accorded to me all the sooner if I show that historical materialism may be of the advantage even to British respectability. I have mentioned the fact that about 40 to 50 years ago, any cultivated foreigner settling in England was struck by what he was then bound to consider the religious bigotry and stupidity of the English respectable middle class. I am now going to prove that the respectable English middle class of that time was not quite as stupid as it looked to the intelligent foreigner. Its religious leanings can be explained. Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels 1892 English Edition Introduction When Europe emerged from the Middle Ages, the rising middle class of the towns constituted its revolutionary element. It had conquered a recognized position within medieval feudal organization, but this position also had become too narrow for its expansive power. The development of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, became incompatible with the maintenance of the feudal system. The feudal system, therefore, had to fall. But the great international center of feudalism was the Roman Catholic Church. It united the whole of feudalized Western Europe in spite of all internal wars into one grand political system, opposed as much to the schismatic Greeks 
as to the Mohammedan, Mohammedan countries. It had organized its own hierarchy on the feudal model, and lastly, it was itself by far the most powerful feudal lord, holding, as it did, fully one-third of the soil of the Catholic world. Before profane feudalism could be successfully attacked in, every, in each country and in detail, this, its secret central organization, had to be destroyed. Moreover, parallel with the rise of the middle class, went on the great re revival of science, astronomy, mechanics, physics, anatomy, physiology, were again cultivated, and the bourgeoisie for the development of its industrial production required a science which ascertained the physical properties of natural objects and the modes of action of the forces of nature. Now up to then, science had but been the humble handmaid of the church, had not been allowed to overlap the limits set by faith, and for that reason had been no science at all. Science rebelled against the church. The bourgeoisie could not do without success, and therefore had to join in the rebellion. The above, though touching, but two of the of the points where the rising middle class was bound to come into conclusion, collision with the established religion, will be sufficient to show first that the class most directly interested in the struggle against the pretensions of the Roman Catholic of the Roman Catholic Church was the bourgeoisie, and second that every struggle against feudalism at that time had to take on a religious disguise, had to be directed against the church in the first instant, instance, but if the universities and the traders of the cities started to cry, it was sure to find and did find a strong echo in the masses of the country people, the peasants, who everywhere had to struggle for their very existence with the feudal with their feudal lords, spiritual and temporal. The long fight of the bourgeoisie against feudalism culminated in three great decisive battles. First was what is called the Protestant Reformation in Germany. The war cry raised against the church by Luther was responded to by two insurrections of a political nature. First, that of the lower nobility under Franz von Sickingen. Then the Great Peasants War, 1525 Anno Domini. Both were defeated, chiefly in consequence to the, of the indecision of the parties most interested, the burghers of the town, an indecision into the causes of which we cannot enter here. From that moment, the struggle degenerated into a fight between the local princes and the central power and ended by blotting out Germany for 200 years. For the politically active nations of Europe, the Lutheran Reformation produced a new creed indeed, a religion adapted to absolute monarchy. No sooner were the peasants of northeast Germany converted to Lutheranism than they were from free men reduced the serfs. But where Luther failed, Calvin won the day. Calvin's creed was one fit for the boldness of the bourgeoisie of his time. His predestination, predestination doctrine was the religious expression of the fact that in the commercial world of competition, success or failure does not depend upon a man's activity or cleverness but upon circumstances uncontrollable by him. It is not of him that willeth, or of him that runneth, but of the mercy of unknown superior economic powers. And this was especially true at a period of economic revolution, when old economic routes and centers were replaced by new ones, when India and America were open to the world, and when 
when even the most sacred economic articles of faith, the value of gold and silver, began to tatter and to break down, Calvin's church constitution of God was republicanized. Could the kingdoms of this world remain subject to monarchs, bishops, and lords, while the German, while German Lutheranism became a willing tool in the hands of princes? Calvinism founded a republic in Holland, and active republican parties in England and above all Scotland. In Calvinism, the second great bourgeois upheaval found its doctrine ready cut and dried. This upheaval took place in England. The middle class of the towns brought it on, and the yeomanry of the country districts fought it out. Curiously enough, in all three great bourgeois risings, the peasantry furnishes the army that has to do the fighting, and the peasantry is the class that, the victory once gained, is most securely ruined by the economic consequences of that victory. A century after Cromwell, the yeomanry of England had almost disappeared. Anyhow, had it not been for the yeomanry and for the plebeian element in the town, the bourgeoisie alone would never have fought this matter out to the bitter end and would never have brought Charles I to the scaffold. In order to secure even those conquests of the bourgeoisie that were ripe for gathering at the time, the revolution had to be carried considerably further. Further, exactly as in 1793 in France and 1848 in Germany, this seems in fact to be one of the laws of evolution of bourgeois society. Well, upon this excess of revolutionary activity, there necessarily fell the inevitable reaction which, in its turn, went beyond the point where it might have maintained itself. After a series of oscillations, the new center of gravity was at, least, was at last attained and became a new starting point. The grand period of English history known to respectability under the name of the Great Rebellion and the struggle succeeding it, were brought to a close by the comparatively puny events attended by the liberal historians, the Glorious Revolution. The new starting point was a compromise between the rising middle class and the ex-feudal landowners. The latter, though cold as now, the aristocracy had been long since on the way which led them to become what Louis, Philippe, and France became at a much later period, the first bourgeois of the kingdom. Fortunately for England, the old feudal barons had killed one another during the War of the Roses. Their successors, though mostly scions of the old families, had been so much out of the direct line of descent the that they constituted a quite a new body, with habits and tendencies far more bourgeois than feudal. They fully understood the value of money, and at once had to increase and at once began to increase their rents by turning hundreds of small farmers out and replacing them with sheep. Henry the Eighth, while squandering the church lands, created fresh bourgeois landlords by wholesale. The innumerable confiscation of estates re granted to absolute or relative upstarts and continued during the whole of the 17th century had the same result. Consequently, ever since Henry VII, the English aristocracy, far from counteracting the development of industrial production, had on the contrary sought to directly profit thereby. And there had always been a section of the great landowners willing, from economical or political reasons, to cooperate with the leading men of the financial and industrial bourgeoisie. The compromise of, 18, of 1689 was, therefore, easily accomplished. The political spoils of pelf and place were left to the great land-owning families, provided the economic interests of the financial, manufacturing, and commercial middle class 
were sufficiently attended to, and these economic inter interests were at that time powerful enough to determine the general policy of the nation. There might be squabbles about matters of details, but on the whole, the aristocratic, aristocratic oligarchy knew too well that its own economic prosperity was irretrievably bound up with that of industrial and commercial middle class. From that time, the bourgeoisie was a humble but still a recognized component of the ruling class of England. With the rest of them, it had a common interest in keeping in subjection the great working mass of the nation. The merchant or manufacturer himself stood in the position of master or, as it was until lately called, of natural superior to his, to his clerks, his workpeople, his domestic servants. His interest was to get as much as, and as good work out of them as he could. For this end, they had to be trained to proper submi submission. He was himself religious, his religion had supplied the standard under which he fought the king and the lords, and he was not long in discovering the opportunities this same religion offered him for working upon the minds of his natural inferiors, and making him submissive to the behests and the masters and it pleased God to place over them. In short, the English bourgeoisie now had to take part in keeping down the lower orders. The the great producing mass in the nation, and one of the means employed for that purpose, was the influence of religion. There was another factor that contributed to strengthen the, re the religious learned leanings of the bourgeoisie. That was the rise of materialism in England. This new doctrine not only shocked the pious feelings of the middle class, it announced itself as a philosophy only fit for scholars and cultivated men of the world. In contrast, the religion, which was good enough for the uneducated masses, including the bourgeoisie, with Hobbes, it stepped on the stage as a defender of royal prerogative and omnipotence. It called upon absolute monarchy to keep down the power robustus, and said, Manatasus. Robust but malicious boy, to wit the people. Similarly, with the successors of Hobbes, with Bolingbroke, Shaftesbury, etc., the new deistic form of materialism remained an aristocratic, esoteric doctrine, and therefore hateful to the middle class, both for its religious heresy and for its anti-bourgeois political connections. Accordingly, in opposition to the materialism and deism of the aristocracy, those Protestant sects which had furnished the flag in the fighting contingent against the Stuarts continued to furnish the main strength of the progressive middle class, and form even today the backbone of the great liberal party. In the meantime, materialism passed from England to France, where it met and coalesced with another materialistic school of philosophers, a branch of Cartesianism. In France, too, it remained, at first, an exclusively aristocratic doctrine, but soon its revolutionary character asserted itself. The French materialists did not limit their criticism to matters of religious belief. They extended to it to whatever scientific tradition or political institution they met with. And to prove their claim of their doctrine to universal application, they took the shortest cut and boldly applied it to all subjects of knowledge in the giant work after which they were named the Encyclopedia. Thus, in one or of the other of its two forms, avowed materialism or deism, it became the creed of the whole culture, the youth of France, so much so that when the Great Revolution broke out, the doctrine hatched by English royalists gave a fear, theoretical flag to Fred, French Republicans and terrorists, and furnished the text for the Declaration of the Rights of Man. The Great French Revolution was the third uprising of the bourgeoisie, but the first that had entirely cast off the religious cloak and was fought out 
and un undisguised political lines. It was the first two that was really thought out, thought out up to the destruction of one of the combatants, the aristocracy, and the complete triumph of the other, the bourgeoisie. In England, the continuity of pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary institutions and the compromise between landlords and capitalists found its expression in the continuity of judicial precedence and in the religious preservation of the feudal forms of law. In France, the revolution constituted a complete breach with the traditions of the past and cleared out the very last vestiges of feudalism and created in the Code Civil a masterly ad adaptation of the old Roman law, that almost perfect expression of the juridical relations corresponding to the economic stage called by Marx the production of commodities, to modern capitalist conditions so masterly that this French Revolution code still serves as a model for reforms of the law of property in all other countries not except in England. Let us, however, not forget that if English law continues to express the economic relations of capitalist society and the barbarous feudal language, which corresponds to the thing expressed just as English spelling corresponds to English pronunciation, vos es severes londres, et vos pronounces constantemente said a Frenchman, that same English law is the only one which has preserved through ages and transmitted to America and the colonies. The best part of the old Germanic personal freedom, local self-government, and the independence from all interference, but that of law courts, which on the continent has been lost during the period of absolute monarchy and has nowhere been as yet fully recovered. To return to our bu British bourgeoisie, the French Revolution gave him a splendid opportunity with the help of the continental monarchies to destroy French maritime commerce, to ex French colonies, and to crush the last French pretensions of to maritime rivalry. That was one reason why he fought it. Another was that the ways of the revolution went very much against his grain. Not only its accessible terrorism, but the very attempt to carry bourgeois rule to extremes. What should the British bourgeoisie do without his aristocracy? That taught him matters such as they were, and invented fashions for him. That furnished officers for the army, which kept order at home and the navy, which conquered colonial possessions and new markets abroad. Aboard. There was indeed a progressive minority of the bourgeoisie, that minority which whose interests were not so well attended to under the compromise. This section composed chiefly of the less wealthy middle class, did sympathize with the revolution, but it was powerless in parliament. Thus, if materialism became the creed of the French Revolution, the God-fearing English bourgeoisie held all the faster to his religion. Had not the reign of terror in Paris proved what was the upshot? If the religious instincts of the masses were lost, the more materialism spread from France to neighboring countries and was reinforced by similar doctrinal currents, notably by German philosophy. The more, in fact, materialism and free thought generally became on the continent, the necessary qualifications of a cultivated man, the more stubbornly the English middle class stuck to its manifold religious creed. These creeds might differ from one another, but they were, all of them, distinctly religious Christian creeds. Socialism Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels while the revolution ensured the political triumph of the bourgeoisie in France, in England, Watt, Arkwright, Cartwright, 
and others initiated an industrial revolution, which completely shifted the center of gravity of economic power. The wealth of the bourgeoisie increased considerably faster than that of the landed aristocracy. Within the bourgeoisie itself, the financial aristocracy, the bankers, etc., were more and more pushed into the background by the manufacturers. The compromise of 18, uh, 1689, even after the gradual changes it had undergone in favor of the bourgeoisie, no longer corresponded to the relative position of the parties to it. The character of these parties too had changed. The bourgeoisie of 1830 was di very different from that of the preceding century. The political parties the political powers still left to the aristocracy and used by them to resist the pretensions of the new industrial bourgeoisie became incompatible with the new economic interests. A fresh struggle with the aristocracy was needed, it could only end in a, in a victory of the new economic power. First, the Reform Act was pushed through in spite of all resistance, under the impulse of the French Revolution of 1830. It gave to the bourgeoisie a recognized and powerful place in Parliament. Then the repeal of the Corn Laws, a move toward free trade, which settled once and for all the supremacy of the bourgeoisie, and especially of its most active portion, the manufacturers, over the landed aristocracy. This was the greatest victory of the bourgeoisie. It was, however, also the last it gained in its own exclusive interest. Whatever triumphed it attained later on, it had the share of a new social power. First its ally, but soon its rival. The Industrial Revolution had created a class of large manufacturing capitalists, but also a class and a far more numerous one of manufacturing workpeople. This class gradually increased in numbers, in proportion as the Industrial Revolution seized upon one branch of manufacture after another, and in the same proportion it increased its power. This power improved as early as 1824 by forcing a reluctant parliament to repeal the acts forbidding combinations of workmen. During the reform agitation, the working men constituted the radical ring of the reform party. The Act of 1832, having excluded them from suffrage, the formulated, they formulated their desire their demands and the people's charter, and constituted themselves in opposition to the great bourgeois anti corn law party into an independent party, the Chartists, the first working men's party of modern times. Then came the Continental Revolutions of February and March 1848, in which the working people played such a prominent part, and, at least in Paris, put forward demands which were certainly inadmissible from the point of view of capital society, and then came the general reaction. First the defeat of the Chartists on April 10th, 1848, then the crushing of Paris, working men's insurrection in June of the same year, then the disasters of 1849 in Italy, Hungary, and South Germany, and at last the victory of Louis Bonaparte over Paris, December 2nd, 1851. For a time, at least, the bugbear of working class pretensions was put down. But at what cost? If the British bourgeoisie, if the British bourgeois had been convinced before of the necessity of maintaining the common people in a religious mood, how much more must he feel that he necess that he that he feel necessity after all these experiences regardless of the sneers of his continental compeers he continued to spend thousands and ten tens of thousands year after year upon the evangelization of the lower orders not content with his own native religious machinery he appealed to Brother Jonathan, the greatest organizer in existence of religion as a trade, and imported from American revivalism, Moody and Sankey, and the like. He accepted the dangerous aid of the Salvation Army, which revives the propaganda of the early Christianity.
appeals to the poor as the elect fights capitalism in a religious way and thus fosters an element of early Christian class antagonism, which one day may become troublesome to well-to-do people who now find, um, find the ready money for it. It seems a law of historical development that the bourgeoisie can in no long, can in no European country get hold of political power, at least for any length of time, in the same exclusive way in which the feudal aristocracy kept hold of it during the Middle Ages. Even in France, where feudalism was completely extinguished, the bourgeoisie as a whole has held full possession of the government for very short periods only. During Louis Philippe's raid, 1830-48, a very small portion of the bourgeoisie ruled the kingdom. By far the largest part, by far the larger part, were excluded from the suffrage by the high qualification. Under the Second Republic, from 1848-51, to 51, the whole bourgeoisie ruled but for three years only. Their incapacity brought on the Second Empire. It is only now, in the Third Republic, that the bourgeoisie as a whole have kept possession of the helm for more than 20 years, and they are already showing lively signs of decadence. A durable reign of the bourgeoisie has been possible only in countries like America, where feudalism was unknown, and society at the very beginning started from a bourgeois basis. And even in France and America, the successors of the bourgeoisie, the working people, are already knocking at the door. In England, the bourgeoisie never held undivided sway. Even the victory of 1832 left the landed aristocracy in almost exclusive possession of all the leading government offices. The meekness with which the middle class submitted to this remained inconceivable to me until the great liberal liberal manufacturer Mr. W. A. Foster, in a public speech, implored the young men of Bradford to learn French as a means to get on in the world, and quoted from his own experience how sheepish he looked when, as a cabinet minister, cabinet minister he had to move at a society where French was, at least, as necessary as English. The fact was, the English middle class of that time were, as a rule, quite uneducated upstarts, and could not help leaving to the, la to the aristocracy those superior government places where other qualifications were required for mere insular narrowness and insular conceit, seasoned by business sharpness. To even now the endless newspaper debates about middle class education show that, Ingl that the English middle class does not yet consider itself good enough for the best education, it looks to something more modest. Thus, even after the repeal of the Corn Laws, it appeared a matter of course that the men who had carried the day, the Camdens, Brights, Forsters, etc., should remain excluded from a share in the official government of the country, until two decades afterwards a new Reform Act opened to them the door of the cabinet. The English bourgeoisie are, up to the present day, so deeply penetrated by a sense of their social inferiority that they keep up, at their own expense, and that of the nation, an ornamental cast of drones to represent the nation worthily at all state functions, and they consider themselves highly honored whenever one of themselves is worthy of admission into the select and privileged body manufactured after all, by themselves. The industrial and commercial middle class had, therefore, not yet succeeded in driving the landed aristocracy completely from political power when another competitor, the working class, appeared at the stage. The reaction after the Chartist movement and the Continental Revolutions, as well as the unparalleled extension of English trade from 1848 to 66, 
This creates vulgarly to free trade alone, but do far more to colossal the the velvet of railways, ocean steamers, and beads of intercourse generally, and again driven the working class into the dependency of the Liberal Party, of which they formed, as in pre chartist times, the radical wing. Their claims to the franchise, however, gradually became irresistible, while the, league, while the wing leaders of the Liberals funked this rally, showed his superiority by making the Tories seize the favorable moment and introduce household suffrage into the boroughs, along with the redistribution of seats. Then followed the ballot, then in 1884, the extension of household suffrages to the country and a fresh redistribution of seats by which electoral districts were to some extent equalized. All of these measures considerably increased the electoral power of the working class, so much so that in at least 150 to 200 constituencies, that class now furnished the majority of the voters. The parliamentary government is a capital school for teaching respect for tradition. If the middle class looked with awe and veneration upon what Lord John Matters playfully called our own nobility, the mass of the working people then looked up with respect and deference to what used to be designated as their betters, the middle class. Indeed, the British working men some fifty years ago was the model workman whose respectful regard for the position of his master and whose, whose self-restraining modesty and claiming rights for himself counseled our German economists of the Cafeteria Socialist School for the incurable communistic and revolutionary tendencies of their own working men at home. But English middle class, good men of business as they are, saw further, saw farther than the German professors. They had shared their powers, but reluctantly, with the working class. They had learned, during the Chartist years, what the Pa Robustus said, Malatasus, the people, is capable of. And since that time, they had been compelled to incorporate the better part of the people's charter in the statutes of the United Kingdom. Now, if ever, the people must be kept in order by moral means, and the first and foremost of all moral means of action upon the masses is and remains religion. <laughs> Hence the parsons' majorities on the school boards. Hence the increasing self-taxation of the bourgeoisie for the support of all sorts of revivalism, from ritualism to the Salvation Army. And now came the triumph of the British respectability over the free thought and religious relaxity of the continental bourgeoisie. The workmen of France and Germany had become rebellious. They were thoroughly infected with socialism, and for very good reasons, were not at all particular as to the legality of the means by which they secure their own ascendancy. The Pan or Bustus here turned from day to day more malatosus or malatiosios. Nothing remained to the French and German bourgeoisie as a last resource but to silently drop their free front free thought as a youngster when sea sickness creeps upon him, quietly drops the burning cigar he brought wirely on board. One by one, the scoffers turned pious in outward behavior, spoke with respect of the church, its dogmas and rites, and even confirmed with the latter as far as, as far as could not be helped. French bourgeois died magri on Fridays, and German ones say out long Protestant sermons in their pews on Sundays. They come to the grief with materialism. Thy religion must invoke unhalted for the dead. Religion must be kept alive for the people. 
that was the only and the last means to save society from utter ruin. Unfortunately for themselves, they did not find this out until they had done their level best to break up religion forever. And now, it was the turn of the British bourgeoisie to sneer and to say, Why you fools? I could have told you that two centuries ago. However, I am afraid neither the religious stolidity of the British nor the post-festum conversion of the continental bourgeois will stem the rising proletarian tide. Tradition is a great breaking force. Is the this an acte of history? But be merely passive is sure to be broken down, and thus religion will be lasting will be no lasting safeguard to capitalist society. If our juridical, philosophical or religious ideas are more either more or less remote offshoots of the economical relations prevailing in a given society, such ideas cannot, in the long run, withstand the effects of a complete change in these relations. And unless we believe in supernatural revelation, we must admit that no religious tenets will ever suffice to prop up a tottering society. In fact, in England too, the working people have begun to move again. They are no doubt shackled by traditions of various kinds. Bourgeois traditions such as widespread belief that there can be but two parties, conservatives and liberals, and that the working class must work out its salvation by and through the great liberal party, working men's traditions inherited from the first tentative efforts of, at independent action, such as the exclusion from ever so many old trade unions of all applicants who have, gone, who have not gone through a regular apprenticeship which means the breeding by wit by every such union of its own black legs. But for all that, the English working class is moving, as even Professor Brentano has sorrowfully had to report to his brother, Catherine Socialists. It moves, like all things in England, with a slow and measured step, with hesitation here, with more or less unfruitful, tentative attempts there. It moves now and then, with an ever, with an over-cautious mistrust on the name of socialism, while it gradually absorbs the substance, and the movement spreads and seizes one layer of the workers after another. It has now shaken off their tapa, the unskilled laborers of the east end of London, and we all know what a splendid impulse these fresh forces have given it in return. And if the pace of the movement is not up to the impatience of some people, let them not forget that it is the working class which keeps alive the finest qualities of the English character, and that, if a step in events is once gained in England, it is, as a rule, never lost afterwards. If the sons of the old Chartists, for reasons that explained above, were not quite up to the mark, the grandsons bid fair to be worthy of their forefathers. But the triumph of the working class European does not depend upon England alone. It can only be secure secured by the cooperation of at least England, France, and Germany. In both the latter countries, the working class movement is well ahead of England. In Germany, it is even within measurable distance of success. The progress it has there made during the last 25 years is unparalleled. It advances with ever-increasing velocity. If the German middle class have shown themselves lamentably deficient in political capacity, discipline, courage, energy, and perseverance, the German working class 
have given ample proof of all these qualities four centuries ago. Germany was the starting point of the first upheaval of the European middle class. As things are now, it is outside the limits of possibility that Germany will be the scene too of the first great victory of the European proletariat. A letter from Frederick Engels, London, April 20th, 1892, Otto Domini. Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels. Introduction to the French edition. The pages which form the subject of the present pamphlet, first published as three articles in the Revue Socialiste, have been translated from the latest book by Engels' Revolution in Science. It is Anting During. Frederick Engels, one of the most one of the foremost representatives of contemporary socialism distinguished himself in 1848-44 with his outlines of a critique of the political economy, which first appeared in the Deutsche Französische Revue Jar Burka, published in Paris by Max and Rouget. The outlines already formulate certain general principles of scientific socialism. Engels was then living in Manchester, where he wrote, in German, The Condition of the Working Class in England, 1845, as dated. An important work to which Marx did full justice in capital. During his first stay in England, he also contributed, as he later did from Brussels, to the Northern Star, the official journal of the Socialist it is the Chartist movement and to the new moral world of Robert Owen. During his stay in Brussels, he and Marx founded the German Workers' Communist Club, linked with Flemish and Walloon working men's clubs, and with Bornstedt, the Deutsche Bruchere Zeitung. At the invitation of the German committee, residing in London, of the League of the Just, they joined this society, which had originally been set up by Karl Chapin after his flight from France, where he had taken part in the Blanqui Conspiracy of 1839. From then on, the League was transformed into an international League of Communists after the, supp after the suppression of the usual formalism of secret societies. Nevertheless, in those circumstances, the society had to remain a secret as far as governments were concerned. In 1847, at the International Congress held by the League in London, Marx and Engels were instructed to draft the Manifesto of the Communist Party, published immediately before the February Revolution and translated at once into almost all the European languages. In the same year, they were involved in founding the Democratic Association of Brussels, an international and public association where the delegates of radical bourgeois, bourgeois and those of the proletarian workers met. After the February Revolution, Engels became one of the editors of the new Rhenish, Zietong, Navarre, Navarre, Gazette, Rane. Founded in 1848 by Marx in Cologne and suppressed in June 1849 in a Prussian coup d'état. After taking part in the rising at Elbefeld, Engels fought in the Biden campaign against the Prussians from June and from June to July 1849 as the aide de camp of Wittich, who was then colonel of a battalion of France. Therese. In 1850, in London, he contributed to the review of the new Rheinische Zeitung, edited by Marx and printed in Hamburg. 
There, Engels for the first time published The Peasant War in Germany, which 19 years later appeared again in Leipzig as a pamphlet and ran into three editions. At the resumption of the socialist movement in Germany, Engels contributed to the Volkstadt and Varwatsch his most important articles, most of which were reprinted in the form of pamphlets such as on social relations in Russia, the Prussian schnapps in the German Reichstag, the housing question, the cantonalist rising in Spain, the Bakunists at work, etc., etc. In 1870, after leaving Manchester for London, Engels joined the General Council of the International, where he was interested with the correspondence with Spain, Portugal, and Italy. The series of final articles which he contributed to the Vorwarts under the ironic title of Herr der Rings Revolution in Science, in response to the allegedly new theories of Mr. E. de Ring on science in general and socialism in particular, were assembled in one volume and were a great success among German socialists. In the present pamphlet, we reproduce the most topical excerpt from the theoretical section of the book, which constitutes what might be termed an introduction to scientific socialism. <laughs>